Greetings, ghouls and goblins, and thank you for following the Reese's Pieces to our doorstep. Welcome to Upper Cinco, the podcast sacrifice where we take stupid shit and put it on a list. I am Brian von Ernstovic, Transylvania's premier podcast host and amateur DJ. Hire me. Today, our soon-to-be-bled-out contestants reveal and defend their top five haunts you wish you were a party to. The man to my right, and your due south, is a hellhound that howls from the bowels of Sopico's quaint restaurant district. It's Mitchell Brinkman. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Welcome. And it's Halloween, you guys. Today, I'm going to be listing off a 70s relief Cubs pitcher, Punky Fidrich. Uh, so let's do it. I'm, I'm ready to go. My arm is loose and my lips as well. Oh, it sounds so sultry. And challenging the Ginger Prince is a fabled fella with plenty of mysterious things to be unfurled. The Book of Spells will one day crack. It's Mr. Nathan Hennenfent. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm I'm well, and I looked before we started rolling for the last Halloween costume I wore, which was a monkey in a business suit, because my nieces like to accuse me of monkey business, but I couldn't find it, so now I, I'm just wearing my bathrobe. <laughs> As a reminder, don't forget to stick with us until the end of the show, where I... Brian van Ernstovic will give you my fast five send off where I'll rattle off the definitive list of the top five scarring Halloween costumes to see your loved ones in. And enough of this. And a quick message for our returning listeners. We love pleasing your ear holes and are always looking for more to fill. So please consider dropping us a review wherever you download fine podcasts and be sure to share with your friends. And if you have a topic or fast five you are dying for us to cover, head on over to bizbear.biz to submit your suggestion. We may even battle it out on an upcoming episode. And for you newbies, let us wake you out of hibernation with a quick rundown of the rules. Each player in the den has spent time with today's topic, arranging their top five answers in order of importance. Those answers have been submitted to the host who will moderate the game, awarding points to the player with the most poignant answer. Starting with their number five choice, we'll move up the ranks until we reach each of their top answers. But if both contestants happen to have the same answer on their list, well, we have an Uber Uber you will hear the official Uber Cinco siren, and both players must reveal their answer and what number they ranked their submission. An Uber stare down is all or nothing, with one player earning three points. After all answers have been read, the host will reveal the final score. And as host, I am entitled to institute a house rule for today's game, which will be simple and on brand for today's theme. Bonus points to the fella who creeps me out the most. Mitch is already winning with that fro. Nathan, you won the <laughs> Nathan, you won the pre All Hallows Eve bingo game, so you will go first with your number five. Okay, uh, number five. This is something I just learned about recently. I was polling some friends about some legends and myths and and spooky tales that I may not be aware of. A friend of mine from Tennessee brought to attention the Bell Witch, so I looked up the Bell Witch. And I fell in love. Uh, the Bell Witch is a, a pretty uh, eccentric ghost. So the Bell family lived on a farm near a cave. And so one of the, the first story I read was, you can still go and tour this cave. Uh, it's open to the public. And so Betsy Bell, who was the daughter in the family, and her friends went and they were exploring in the cave. And then one little rascal decided he was going to crawl into a crevasse. And he got stuck. <laughs> So this voice, this disembodied voice cries out, I'll get him out. And then <laughs> the bell witch gives him a little shove, pushes him back. And then the disembodied voice of the bell witch proceeded to give the children a lecture on the dangers of reckless cave exploring unsupervised <laughs> with no adults or chaperones. <laughs> so this is this is allegedly in the, the like the early 1800s but it sounds like a an episode of the magic school bus but uh wow it gets I, oh, go I, ahead uh, oh, I, I, I was gonna say i it, it sounds like the like the local college their mascot has to be like the spelunking spirits the the, the galloping ghost <laughs> 
but they, she she had a few other uh, exploits that were spooky in, in unconventional ways. Like th- there was a uh, word spread, like people like Andrew Jackson were coming to find out about the Bell Witch, and it was it was became very famous. But uh, a guy from England shows up to investigate. He's volunteering. He's going to put himself in the line of fire. And then the disembodied voice of the Bell Witch comes back and like, all right, we need to prove that this is real. So, you know, say something to me that only I would know and nobody else, you know, could possibly know about me. And she spoke in the voice with the English accents of his parents. So that freaked him out. Mm -hmm. And then and then she started receiving word from his parents she was his parents were hearing his voice all the way over in england so she was uh two places at once and so she started relaying messages back and forth to them in real time and this isn't haunting she's just inventing the cell phone this is really <laughs> remarkable <laughs> so and then she had some other uh good intentioned uh uh haunts like she warned Betsy Bell from marrying a ne'er do well. She eventually called off the the wedding. Uh, she regarded Lucy Bell, who's the matriarch of the family, as and this is a quote: "the most perfect woman to walk the earth." And she would bring her gifts, such as fruit. Who doesn't love fruit? Oh, However, wow. she did poison uh, John Bell <laughs> Senior after threatening him for several years. One he little died. thing, <laughs> yeah, and just, then yeah. and then at his funeral, she interrupted the congregation by boisterously singing drinking songs so <laughs> i i personally i personally would love to meet the bell witch i'm gonna be taking a trip down to tennessee as soon as uh covid is not a thing anymore uh so you know maybe 30 40 years from now i'm hoping to meet the bell witch i hope i don't get poisoned but if i do you know i th- who better to get poisoned by? But hopefully I, I learn a lesson about uh, simple spelunking safety or <laughs> and brought some some figs or whatever the case may be. I don't know what they grow in Tennessee. But yeah, the Bell Witch. It was a lot of fun learning about her today. <laughs> so I like how this started from something that initially sounded like it was created by the marketing company that created Smokey the Bear. Then it goes <laughs> down this rabbit hole to like, oh, it's she's the actually the Alexander Graham Bell Witch. She's communicating across the the ocean here, and now she can do a bunch of magical stuff and is poisoning people probably. So she's I mean, unpredictable. What a she- roller coaster! <laughs> I feel like we've gone on a little ride here. <laughs> I'm glad we learned something today. Oh man, what would the modern day Bell Witch be if someone was to make up something off the cuff to keep a kid from going somewhere? And would any kids buy it today? I don't think it'd be like, shut up, mom. It was not a, it would be really hard to fool kids now. Yeah. (laughs) They already, like, what are you going to tell them and say that's, that's not plausible because their phone can already do it? Yeah. We hold something in our pocket that can do anything that would have been considered witchcraft up until 10 years ago. So there's, I don't know how you're going to fool children anymore. It's, (laughs) yeah. The Bell Witch of the 21st century says TikTok causes you to lose everything out your scrotum. (laughs) Stay off the phones! (laughs) That's the closest I I got. I was I, I was gonna say I feel like the the strength of of uh, religions you know are still there in our world so maybe something that's scaring kids with religion but is anyone religious anymore it doesn't feel like it uh, that's actually not but, a bad thing like somebody would like who wants to keep people in a religion comes up with a version of the bell witch to scare people scare them yeah. back straight into staying with said religion yeah yeah it's like making up like some sort of monster with a tail and two horns that will tempt you into doing terrible things and then there's a horrible place where there's fire and brimstone you'll be tortured i mean that might work that's kind of spooky history (laughs) repeats itself amazing (laughs) wow oh god all right mitch you need to top this what's your number five to top the bell witch yeah so my number five um it's not a it's not a uh a uh, well-known phenomenon like the Bell Witch, but it is something that happened to me personally. And I felt like I was inside of the start of a horror film. Um, and I was at a little tavern that uh, my costume tonight, for those of you uh, 
listening on YouTube um, that my costume, Punky Fidget, would have uh, definitely gone and had a beer at before uh, in the 70s. I was at the l l Tavern, and this was about two years ago. It was on a Sunday night, and I was there with my girlfriend, and we were about to embark on NaNoWriMo, which is you write a novel in 30 days. And we were looking for, for chaff. We, we, we were looking for material. We were looking for grist, you know. What better place than the l l Tavern? Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a famous killer-friendly bar. Um, and this, my number five, is the loner that we met at this bar. And uh, Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer's serial killer, used to drink here on a regular basis. John Wayne Gacy, serial killer, uh, <laughs> was confirmed to have had a drink at this bar. Um, it's a, it's, it hasn't changed since... I don't know when it opened. It could be the 60s, could be the 30s, no idea. Um, the, 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 the cigarette smoke sits in the walls. It sits in the floor. It sits in the chairs. It's everywhere. Um, the, the, the smoke sits in the patrons. Uh, they, I've ne- <laughs> never seen a more uh, leathery and um, sad bunch. Like, you know, they, they, they change size with every breath. It's like they're all cigarettes themselves kind of. Uh, but so we're, we're at the bar here. And of course, we stick out like sore thumbs. We have notebooks with us. We order our drinks. And this guy engages us and is talking to us. And he has this real creepy stare. He's clearly been drinking all day. Um, He no longer either has any money or he never brought any money to begin with because he's expecting the bartender to just give him drinks on credit, to just know that he's good for it, and or just telling the bartender to give him free drinks. What? And you can tell... That the bartender like under like knows his danger because the bartender is spending as little time as possible near him. But this guy is telling us that like at any moment, at any moment, he could sleep with the bartender. Like he has her on a string. Like she is in his pocket. And again, wasted. Uh, imagine a man. He he's got like track pants on. Um, he had like a <laughs> turtleneck. He had sun, like sporty sunglasses, but they were like up on his forehead. He was is where he had them, and but just ha- had one of those stares where he just he looks at you, but it's like he's not his eyes don't register your eyes. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever looked at someone like that before. Like it's just dead inside, <laughs> and um, we 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 weren't rude. We weren't like sir, stay away from us. So naturally, someone like this person. Uh, you know, their 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 shoulders kind of hunch over, mm-hmm. and they kind of like create like a natural shell around you. Sort, of, and, the, and you get he gets closer, and he gets closer with every minute, and he and he feigns the need to talk closer and closer, and to listen closer and closer. Um, and he's got like hot, bad breath, you know, too. That where you've just been at the bar for seven hours straight, smoking and drinking and smoking and drinking, and he starts to. Uh, like brag to us. He brags about he has a house on the North Shore. He has a wife and kids. It's a nice house, but he's just slumming it. It's a Sunday. He's just slumming it in the city for the day, watching football, he claims, and drinking, that kind of thing. But he hates his wife, and, and he's he's ready to leave her for a younger woman. And then he he starts telling us about his career as a professor at MIT, how he's a, he's a brilliant man, <laughs> and how when he was a professor there, he would coerce and or suggest to female students that if they slept with him, that they would get better grades. And he did this with numerous students. And the creepiest part where at this point, uh, we both like Danny and I like had this unspoken, we just looked at each other and we knew like, okay, we need to extricate ourselves from the situation. After describing this, this professorial situation, he, he then said, and none of the women learned anything at all. And we just, oh, God. Oh. oh. And throughout this conversation, he also made us aware. He was like, you guys know this is the killer bar, right? Like, this is where, like, absolute creeps hang out, you know? Like, oh my this God. is where the – and so, like, he was, he was, like, just basically telling us – that like we shouldn't trust anyone and should be wary of everyone around us. And he kept trying to paint me as a really stupid frat boy to Danny. So he, he kept, he kept trying to drive a wedge between me and my girlfriend, you know, this stranger to him. 
Jeez. And 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 he kept he he said it like 10 15 times like can you trust him? Danny, can you trust him? Are you sure you can trust this guy? As he was trying to create this relationship with her on the spot as if she should trust him and like dispose of me on the spot. Yeah. Um I was so uncomfortable. My body was tingling the whole time. I couldn't write anything down. We were there to like take notes or whatever, or just write thoughts down or something, whatever. And it was like, we we're going to have a beer, write for like 15 minutes and move on to another spot. And like the whole time, I just was like, I I feel uncomfortable. I don't want this guy to know my name, anything about me, how old I am, any identifying information where he could maybe look me up later anything of that nature and so as soon as he got up and he yelled at the bartender like i'm having a smoke like get me another beer or whatever it was gets up to leave i turn to look at damien i'm like we're going right now let's we're, let's we're out 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 Ugh. and we're outside and we're booking it down the block and i keep looking behind my back tr- hope like fingers crossed this guy I, I didn't expect him to necessarily follow us but I also didn't want him to know like what direction we lived even. I, like I was that creeped out. And so we took a, a, a circuitous way home and both thoroughly creeped. I think we went to, to like Mariano's after that, you know, very well lit business for like a while. <laughs> Mariano's and, is the closest oh, place. Yeah. <laughs> sanctuary. Just, sanctuary. Yes. <laughs> just the, just oh, the cleansing. God. The... the, the <clears throat> I, I, and also, I needed to release that tension for you guys too. Just, just like the <laughs> cleansing brightness of the Mariano's fluorescence <laughs> is incredible. And like we got some groceries and we go home. <clears throat> Excuse me. But then a month later, I shit you not, I'm walking home towards our house on Addison, and it's maybe like maybe two blocks, maybe three blocks max away from our house. And I'm walking by and I look to my right and there's these two gentlemen exiting an apartment building and it is this exact same guy and another low life looking motherfucker. And, yeah. and you know, you know how you watch scary movies and you're always like, I would never, I'd never clam up. I'd, I'd know what to do. I'd like, I'd snap to it and I'd know exactly which door to run to first and lock and which window to close second and all that kind of thing. I clammed up like a child and just like quickly walked home like I was about to shit my pants. Like that's all I could do. <laughs> I couldn't even text Dan. I was like, had my phone. I was like, I can't even, I just have to keep walking. I'm too, too conspicuous. Yeah. So to this day, I don't know if that, that was that man's house. And I mean, cause it wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, he didn't actually live in on the North shore. He was just some weird, creepy, yeah, loner, for sure. drunk or whatever. Uh, like, was that his roommate? Was that his killing partner? Was that his best friend? Was that his lover? Who knows? I don't know. I I so badly wish that it had turned out he lived in your building. Oh <laughs> God, it would be. God. And he was just really nice. He was just when he got drunk, he just like turned into a killer. Oh, it, tur- it turned that's out a he movie was right there. Turned out he was the neighbor from Home Alone. Actually, he was. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Which we learned on that episode is uh, is an origin of like an eight year long nightmare for me as a child. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, but taking a step back, how recent was this? This was uh, the end of 2018. So November okay, so it's, so 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 it's been a little bit. Yeah. So between this encounter with the fellow at the bar, between an episode early on where you said you like to enjoy starting conversations with old people at diners. Have you learned nothing about <laughs> engaging the public? <laughs> Why do you do this to yourself? This was this was this was easily easily the 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 creepiest person I've ever met in Chicago by far. I didn't feel the most at danger. That was when I was talking to a, a bus boy who uh, claimed direct descendancy to a um, drug cartel leadership strain course, in Mexico. And, and <laughs> that happened too. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and claimed that his, that his friends were like coming there to meet us and like we should stick around because he wanted, he, he was hitting on my friend Maggie and he wanted, he was interested. So he didn't want to be turned down. And so it'd be very smart of us not to, not to turn him down and to hang out with him. Um, well, the good news here is you, there. 
you told the story publicly uh, uh, online, so now he can. Well, this is why you're yeah. wearing the disguise, right? This is exactly a this form is of witness protection. <laughs> I'm 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 Punky Fedrich, '70s relief pitcher for the Chicago Cubs. Yeah, good. Now uh, he doesn't know who you actually are. Thank God. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's time so. to score this round. Uh, Nathan, you, you you taught me something new about the Bell Witch. I'm definitely going to go down that rabbit hole. And you also used a lot of alliteration, um, spelunking, searching, and all this stuff. Really, really got to the uh, grammar nerd in me, so that was great. Mitch, I was only going to give you one point because you said that people's skin were leathery and full of tar. That gave me horrible flashbacks. The neighbors who used to live uh, by my parents' house, she smoked so much the bird cage in her house was just caked with tar. Oh God! Oh, yeah. that's a f- put that in a movie. Oh my oh, God. God! So her walls were yellow. The cage was brown. Somehow the birds lived, but because uh, you went into witness protection, I'm going to give you the full three points because it hey. really creeped me out. That was pretty. That was pretty messed up. Thank you. We are not going snake round today. We are going to bounce back to Wait, Mr. How many, Nathan. Wait, how many points did I get? You didn't you say. Got two. Uh, if, I, if I didn't say, you got two points. We are going to move on to Nathan for his number four. Nathan hit us. My number four, I'm sticking with the mo- mostly uh, generous uh, ghosts. I'm going with the most generous ghost of them all. The ghost of Christmas present from Charles Dickens, The Christmas Carol. Oh my god! <laughs> but but even more specifically, the gigantic felt version that escorted Michael Caine around in the Muppet version <laughs> of A Christmas Carol from 1992, directed by Brian Henson, uh, starring the great Gonzo as Charles Dickens, <laughs> and as I mentioned, Sir Michael Caine as uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. So. <laughs> <laughs> number number one, if you know, I, hopefully I don't have to be haunted by the ghosts of Christmas uh, past, who's a bit oh, creepy. Oh, you will, you will, yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> reliving, reliving my past is is something I do every day in my mind, and my therapist and I are working <laughs> on it. But we'll we'll leave that for another episode. And then, of course, the ghost of Christmas future, who just shows me my death. Well, that's not that's not fun for anybody. Mm. But the ghost of Christmas present. Hopefully, I'll get to sing the sing the little song uh, that they do in the Muppet version. But also, I could be transported to Christmas parties all across town. Scrooge goes to his nephew Fred's. <laughs> he goes to the Cratchit house. He goes to poor family. He goes to like seventeen different Christmas parties in one day. But he he's not seen. He doesn't have to interact with anybody. He just gets to go and enjoy. He, you know, I'm sure. The ghost can do anything he wants. He, I can, he'll allow me to, to eat the food and drink and I won't have, you know, I won't be full. I'll get to eat about as many Christmas dinners in one day as I want. Nobody can see me. And if we're true to the, the, the book and the films, I get to stay in my bathrobe all day. That's how I like to spend Christmas Day. 90% <laughs> of the Christmas days of my life have just been in my pajamas and bathrobe all day. As they should be, yes. Don't change out of it. I smell terrible at the end of it. Of course. And I'm bloated and a little too drunk. And but but this is the other great thing is every I'll know everything that happened. I'll know everything that my relatives and friends and family said about me in my absence. <laughs> <laughs> and then and they'll they won't think I was there, but they'll they'll be they'll by the end of the day they'll have a, a little too much uh, mold wine and eggnog and they'll be pretty toasty. And then I'll be able to recount memories of the day and they'll be like, I didn't think you were there. And I'll be like, oh, well, you just you threw a few too many back and I'll never be able to prove that I wasn't. And then they'll say like, well, you're not in any of the pictures. I'm like, yeah, because I was taking them. So I get to have I get to have an endless Christmas all in one day uh, while being haunted by a ghost. I don't see how there's any negatives here. So mm. there you go. Mm. Ghost of Christmas present, the big gregarious man in the green robe himself. That's my number four. But isn't the ghost I, of Christmas present trying to show you all the things you're missing out on presently? <laughs> like, well, well, yeah, but it was, <laughs> but maybe, maybe, he, maybe he got yeah. like, maybe he got the wrong apartment number. And so he's just showing me stuff I would have had, but it's just, it's just even more. So, so it's espionage leading you and 
It's breaking and entering without the breaking and entering is what you're hoping to get. Out exactly. Of this. <laughs> I mean, an abundance of joy and gifts. I'm hoping for Christmas at Halloween, basically, is what I'm hoping for. Sort of a reverse nightmare before Christmas situation. Nice. Now, you said you, you're, you're going to smell at the end of uh, a Christmas <laughs> holiday. Uh, what is, what's that aroma? Walk us through that. Is that a nightmare in and of itself? <laughs> well, it's it, it's it's a mixture of the bad and the good. I mean, I'll smell like a grown man who hasn't changed out of his pajamas for twenty four hours and hasn't gotten up off the couch. But I'll have hold some on, nice on, some cinnamon. It, 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 it's longer than twenty four hours, right? I mean, like you probably have the same boxers on, right, as you put on on the twenty third. Well, it depends on how the 24th goes. No, I, 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 do, I do like to have a nice Christmas Eve uh, Christmas Eve uh, stint in the hot tub. So, you know, there'll, there'll be that. Oh. You, you guys don't do the Christmas Eve in the hot tub? <laughs> I, what? Oh, you, you live very different lives than I do. <laughs> Apparently, oh, man. <laughs> I do. My, uh, d- d- uh, our Minnesota tradition is the uh, Christmas Eve cold shower uh, before you put to bed, <laughs> uh, expecting just one gift in the morning. And that's it. So. Uh. <laughs> Well, I'd also, I would also smell of, of, of cinnamon and, and cloves and... Uh, oh, of course, yeah. You know, a little bit of the, the, the turkey and dressing would be we'd be filtering through there as they would be dribbling down my flannel pajama shirt. So, <laughs> it would... It, uh, yeah, I love Christmas. What can I say? <laughs> do, you, do you guys always have a turkey on Christmas as well? So, it's turkey on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yes. Actually, no, we, we, we usually have a, a ham at Christmas. Oh, okay, uh, cool! Lots okay. of we have the stuffing. We we do uh we do an egg casserole uh every Christmas morning with oh. some cinnamon rolls. Ooh. My next door neighbor Lois Kelly always brings us a nice cake that she decorates. It's been the exact same cake for th- the thirty four years that I've been alive. It's been the same cake every year. Looks wow. flawless. Maybe she made them all back in the seventies and they've been in the freezer. I don't know, but they are God. identical. Yeah, and delicious. <laughs> um, do you think any, any of them any years has ever had syrup of epicac or arsenic in any of them yes yes okay. I do <laughs> <laughs> but it's but in my, back to Halloween but, spooky, but in, in my know. in my scenario I get that whole day that I've just described to you but I also true. will be at the uh, Brinkman and Ernst residence you won't see me but I'll be there I'll get to participate in all the fun traditions that, that you have I'll get to smell all the aromas that you smell like by the end of Christmas Day, whatever those may be. Do you do you see what I do on Christmas Eve uh, when the rest of my family goes up to bed and I'm the last one up? I will be there for that, yes. Okay. And I'm right. looking okay. forward to it. Okay. All right. <laughs> We okay, actually um, skin and dry age a whole reindeer hanging the jerky in the living room. So you're going to see <laughs> quite the show. <laughs> I, That's I'm, Nordic. I'm, that I'm, sounds I'm ter- very Nordic. I'm terrified yeah. to ask where you get the reindeer. Is this Santa's reindeer itself that you you kidnap Who while he's delivering the presents? Who the hell cares about Donner? Fuck Don. But that's eat. but that's one year. You got you've only you've got maximum nine years, and then Santa's out of reindeer. Well, we've only been doing it for eight, so. 2020 might be the end of this uh, tradition. So, oh. way to if, end the if year. You're lis- if you're listening, Vixen, get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, on to Mitch. Your number four. What's your, your spooky haunt you would like to be a party to? Sure. Yeah. Um, mine is um, a uh, one that is very well known, but uh, it fascinates me to no end. And that is to experience the Winchester Mansion spirit bonanza, I'm calling it. Um, so uh, this was built by um, Sarah Winchester, who was the widow of William Winchester, who I believe was the son of the founder of Winchester Repeating Arms, the gun company. So he dies. And this young lady, uh, prior to her husband passing, she had a child die as well. Uh, from a horrible disease where, like, I read the child just kind of wastes away. Very sad. Mm. Uh, but she inherited um, what would be in today's money $500 million. But this is in, like, the uh, mid-1800s or early 1800s. And then also she gets half of the Winchester Gun Company as well. So she's bringing in 
equivalent of like $26,000 uh, a day from this company as well. So she's got just oodles and boodles of cash. And they're living on the East Coast, as all rich people did in those, in those uh, days. And she sees a psychic, and the psychic tells her, uh, claiming to be speaking through her husband, that she needs to move out of her house, go west, build a new house, to um, house all of the spirits that have been killed and lives ruined by the guns that her that that their company has created, mm-hmm. so she heads west. She buys a simple farmhouse at the time, in what is now San Jose, and just starts building. There's no architect. She hires builders, um, and the way the house gets designed and built is through daily and or weekly seances for psychics that are communicating with the spirits there that tell her how to build this house. Utter insanity. Again, this setup, she has unlimited cash to do this. Uh, and of course, so, I'm so, sure every- so in other words, it's just a bunch of people standing in a circle, making things up. That's what we're getting at, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. And so at the end of this house construction, it takes a long time. And also, well, it, Part of it, too, was that people think that Sarah believed if she was ever done constructing the house, then the spirits would get her and she'd be killed, basically. So, like, she was always, always in construction, technically. Uh, but at her, de- at her death, the house, um, it was seven stories, which is just obviously insane. It had 161 rooms, 47 fireplaces, 10,000 uh, windows. Two basements. 10,000 windows. 10,000 windows. Wow. Um, there was a number of like original Tiffany pieces, some that e- that she even designed herself like with the with the Tiffany designers. Tiffany windows that were placed in uh, locations that would never actually get sunlight on them because she had windows on interior walls. Uh, I mean, just absolute, absolute insanity. Um, and uh, – the uh, what else do I have here? The, 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 uh, oh, sorry, three elevators as well. And this house was crazy because it had uh, hot running water, it had indoor plumbing, it had uh, forced uh, heat, which is like at this time in what was like 1850 or whenever it was finished, like no house has had that. You know, at this time when they first started building this house the president was andrew jackson so he yes was like it's all still, pre-civil war we're talking yeah, here pre-civil war with modern so, yeah. yeah um so just like utter utter fucking bananas going on here uh out in 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 california here and uh, uh out of the 13 bathrooms in the home only one was functional at the end um in an effort <laughs> in an effort to confuse any ghosts who are wishing to haunt a spigot um, so <laughs> interest, on. right? Yeah. And, uh, she would sleep in a different room every single night. Cause there was like 40 bedrooms and she would take secret passageways from room to room. So ghosts and spirits could not follow her. And I, 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 I deign to suggest perhaps a spirit could follow her cause they can just go through walls. Right. I mean, Casper, um, if we're guessing that a spirit can come through whatever realm it is that she believes in to go from that world to this, she thinks some studs and plaster are going to keep them from seeing her go through this tunnel. Like what the hell's the point of this? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think some people, and I think, uh, fair enough. were like, maybe she's a little, you know, who knows? A little, a little, a little crazy. I, I for one admire crazy. this woman. Yes. I admire this woman because every day when she woke up, she had a goal. She had an objective. She had a plan. She mm-hmm. executed it. She had to be very fulfilled by all of this. Yeah. She wasn't she wasn't just aimlessly. She wasn't getting getting up and stroking her carrot and playing Xbox. She had <laughs> shit to do. <laughs> and at Every the end day. of the day when she had another wing built on with a staircase that went to nowhere, she had to feel a real sense of accomplishment. Yeah. And she yeah. woke up the next morning and she's like, "Yep." I fought off the ghost one more day. And you know what? I'm going to fucking do that shit again. Mm-hmm. She's like, boys, build me a room where all my cucumbers can live for the rest of their days. Thank you. <laughs> you know, 
Yeah, every day. The, the Cucatorium, it was called. It, yes, it was. <laughs> uh, goal number one, every single day, confuse the ghosts. You know, very yeah. few people can say that. Um, but, I mean, this this house, it's still open. You can go see it. You can go walk through whatever. Um, there's obviously tons of, Nathan mentioned, stairways to nowhere. There was, like, stairways uh, to um, th- that have different rises and runs. Um, uh there's like 2000 doors in the, in the, in the house, like the original structure of the house. There are some that just like open onto um, like a 15 foot fall onto a random kitchen. One of them opens onto an, <laughs> uh, on an exterior Why? wall. Why? What? Yeah. Is, at least put a just, brick wall there or something. What's the point? It just, it, it just made no sense. You just, you just build it to build it. You just build it to build well, it. So ghosts, ghosts notoriously susceptible to gravity. Yes. So, <laughs> right? Nice yeah. little booby trap. Yeah. At least put a room at the bottom there with them, some spikes or something. <laughs> Make it useful. Right? Yeah. Um, and uh, what was, was also interesting is, so like she continues to build and build and build and build. Um, and then in the, it was like 1906, there was a giant earthquake that rocked this part of California. And the top three floors of the house became uninhabitable and they had to remove them. So the house currently is still only four floors. So it lost its top three floors. Earthquake? Or ghosts. <gasps> Thank you. Doom, doom, Thank doom. you. Uh, <laughs> and I've seen a photo of the original structure. And it's just like the top three floors, quote unquote, they're insane. They're just like, it's like if you had like, hi, four-year-old. Um, here's a bunch of candy. Now, tell me all about unicorns and, and like what platforms you'd want to watch them from. And they're like, oh, yes, let me decide. <laughs> it, you know. uh, and it's just, it's just, just utterly insane. And also the fact that this whole time she's making all of this money from gun sales and it's just going to building this fucking house and not helping anyone. That also I'm like, this is kind of awful. But because of that, there are so many angry ghosts that I'm sure haunted her every living moment, which makes me kind of happy in some ways and <laughs> makes me want to wish I could have been there in that house going insane, trying to find a door to nowhere or to somewhere either way. Um, and, you know, running into priceless chandeliers and pieces of art that are, like, tucked away in a weird, you know, uh, hallway that, like, goes from eight feet wide down to, like, one foot wide just because the builder that day felt fun. Um, Quickly. It's an uh, interesting uh, psychological uh, analysis of perhaps she literally – this was a manifestation of the guilt she felt – for all of this, but then she felt like she had to keep funding it through more gun sales, which meant more deaths, which meant more guilt, which meant more doorways and windows, and, and it's just an endless, repeating, vicious cycle. Yes, exactly. But the, but, but to the cucatorium, you gotta <laughs> have it. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask Mitch, what is your number one type of room you would have designed in said house? Oh my god. I mean, I, I, I think like an ancient built out of like shells from the ocean there in California, I think a mirror room would be incredible. One where like, you're not sure where the corners are. Um, a fun house. You, <laughs> you yeah. want a fun house. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a skylight. So like during the day, it's just absolutely disorienting. Um, and maybe there's some rotation to it too. So once you walk in, like you're not walking back out the same way, something, I, I, I don't know exactly how, but um and uh, I, I thought for sure you were going to say the masturbatorium would have been <laughs> necessary. <laughs> oh, but well, but I've, always, still- I've always, always said the masturbatorium is any room if you have enough imagination. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my joke. I was going to say, I'm very creative, Nathan. Don't lend my, my, uh, my imagination. But uh, uh, but what so what what's really terrifying is that clearly this house drove this woman crazy. Um, and. Uh, when she died, she mentioned this house in her will exactly zero times. That's weird. That is your wow. entire life. So zero did you read up on what happened? How did it become a public staple that people could visit? So her niece uh, became her assistant and was be- bequeathed everything at the end. So like she got control of the house just by kind of like, de facto because the lawyers were like well you got everything you know else it. yeah so you get this too she she cleared the house out of all of everything auctioned it all off 
And because it was such a batshit, crazily built house, uh, I'm assuming too full of ghosts, full of spirits, full of of curses. Uh, local uh, uh, like inspectors declared it had like zero value. So an in- a local investor bought it for like 140 grand. In this would have been, you know, maybe like the 1920s or something. There, maybe a little later than that. Um, and then literally within six months, they had bought and all got all new furniture inside there and opened it up and and started tours. So um, it's kind of a bummer. The original furniture is not in there. I think that would have been uh, right the real real selling point. There. I do remember it back like twenty years ago, probably seeing something on the Travel Channel or the Discovery Channel, some specials about this house they would run at Halloween. And yeah, this is a this is a fascinating one. I would love to visit this someday. Yeah, we, and if, if you want, uh, Helen Mirren plays Sarah Winchester in a film that came out in the past five years ish. I think called Winchester, um, isn't it? Yes, yes, that is what. Yeah, that's the name of it. So oh, we'll have um, to look into that. All right, it I is just, time to score our number four round. Sorry, did you have one more thing? Oh no, I I was just gonna say this. This all super fascinating to me because my favorite street in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I grew up, is full of giant old homes that are all at least a hundred years old. Big stone things, a lot of creepy nooks, a lot of creepy crannies, if you will. Um, and it just, I feel like always there's those there's those dark secrets in these rich families where you're just like either the main person or like a weird cousin or that, or that odd daughter just had that thirst for blood, you know. Uh, so. <laughs> and it is genetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have one follow-up question for Nathan. You said on a holiday that you get turkey and dressing. What is your definition of dressing in that sentence? Uh, I, I don't think I use the word dressing because that's not a word I use. I, I My family always uses stuffing, which is uh, quite... You confused me. You said dressing, and then you Did follow I? up with stuffing later. So the fact that you clarified it to stuffing means you're getting the full three points for this All round right, because there we go. dressing's Boom. messed up. Uh, just not dressing. It is stuffing. You stuff stuffing. it in the bird. You rip it out. Even if it doesn't make it into the bird, it's still fucking stuffing. Uh, and you brought up Christmas, my favorite holiday. So I'm glad we brought that up on a Halloween episode. Three points. <laughs> uh, Mitchell, what do you get? Uh, this is fascinating. I need to learn more about it, but I feel like uh, this leans too much on the supernatural for me, so I can only give you two points. Uh, we got a deep dive uh, into this in a future episode, I think, the top five rooms in said house, and uh, oh, we will we will wonderful. go into that later. So two points for you, sir. This is back to Nathan now for his number three. My number three, this is something where I don't want to be haunted by anything. I actually want to legitimately be the the haunter, the mm. specter. Uh, but this is a, a tradition called the Poe Toaster, which ran for, it. depending on what source you uh, read, from possibly as early as the 1930s up until 2009 then discontinued and it's now running in a different fashion which i will explain uh in a few seconds but so this happened every i think it's january 19th is edgar Allan poe's birthday Um. in in, uh in baltimore poe's hometown and uh there is a cenotaph which marks uh I don't think he's actually buried there. I don't know if anybody knows exactly where he's buried, but there's a church and a cemetery where there is the memorial. Under the floorboards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, lame, lame. Sorry, continue. <laughs> so, so what would happen? Uh, possibly as early as the 1930s, but definitely there's reference in print to it, I believe, from 1949 onwards was uh, in the the middle of the night on Poe's birthday, a mysterious figure in in a cloak with a a wide brim black hat and a scarf and a cane would uh, covertly sneak his way through, like into the churchyard. He probably had some assistance from some people at the church who were also Poe enthusiasts who like, maybe there was like one guy who might've known his identity or, you know, but it was very much kept under wraps and he would, make his way to the gravesite, and then he would uh, place three roses on the tomb 
and then he had it would have a very expensive bottle of cognac, and he would pour one drink, and he would toast the memory of Edgar Allan Poe, and then he would leave the the bottle of cognac with the rest of the you know probably ninety percent of it still there, and then he would disappear into the night, and this happened every year for decades, and then it uh, fuck me. It started to develop a cult following <laughs> as, you know, people wanted to see him and nobody ever, nobody ever unmasked him. Uh, but people would stand like outside. They would try to figure out where he was coming from, but nobody ever caught him. There was one attempt in the early 2000s where people tried to unmask him. But eventually, you know, by that point, people had started to respect the tradition. However, uh, in the late, like in the 90s, uh, some notes started to be left by the, the Poe toaster. Uh, that indicated that he was passing the torch to a, a son. And so then the son took over and it was it got very bizarre. He would start leaving notes that were not exactly tasteful or in the spirit of the tradition. Like he he when the New York Giants played the Baltimore Ravens in the Super Bowl, he left a very pro New York Giants note. And that was <laughs> probably when the tradition jumped the shark. Yeah, it didn't go over very well. And then uh, in 2009, there was one, like the guy from, uh, I believe is the the Poe Museum there. Like there was, the toaster had a signal to him to kind of let him know when he was coming or, or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but apparently in 2009, the note that he left was so bizarre that he, he didn't even release the contents of it to the public. And then uh, the next year, everybody showed up and the Poe toaster did not show up and the year after he didn't. So 2009 marked the exact 200th birthday of Edgar Allan Poe. So a pretty logical place to end it. So then uh, maybe I think it was 2016, the official Poe Museum people and the, the people at the church or the parish or whatever the case may be, started doing something during the day where there is a guy who's still anonymous, but he walks out playing the violin. And I looked this up on YouTube and it all seems incredibly cheesy, whereas the original <laughs> seems mysterious. And, you know, there's cool. a real a real air of the spirit of Edgar Allan Poe about it. And so I would genuinely like to be. And of course, if anybody hears this podcast, they will now immediately suspect me if this ever happens i would love nothing more than to every january 19th to get dressed up in my cape and my wide-brimmed hat and covertly sneak through the tunnels or through the uh, catacombs of the church and then mysteriously appear drink my cognac and leave a, a cryptic and ethereal note and then just disappear into the night and never be caught i would love to do that from now and to my to my old age i think it's a really beautiful tradition i'm sorry i never got to see it i think the way they're doing it now just is kind of lame uh i could resurrect it of course i've ruined that dream now by stating this publicly but uh <laughs> yeah i love Edgar Allan poe i read some poe stories every uh october gets me in the halloween spirit so this would have been something really cool Wow. I agree. I mean, that's, I mean, I feel like a shitty son just ruined a really cool tradition. <laughs> that's kind of what, <laughs> yeah. what this all happened. Yeah. Like, this isn't, I'm, I'm going to change it. I'm going to make it my own. And you know what? These notes are going to get wacky. <laughs> <All right? laughs> I, I do, I do love that it was kept under, like, still to this day, nobody knows who the original guy or the son was. Uh, which I think is pretty ama- it, that would be so hard to do now, um, yeah, I, almost impossible. But I, I do think it's really cool that this went on for so long that both the that guy and any accomplices he had were so dedicated to it that it never slipped. And also, mm-hmm. the people who went to view the tradition were all for so long unanimously dedicated to respecting it that they didn't yeah. try to sabotage it in any way. Are there any yeah. stories or oral traditions or theories that people think that if this is not a real person doing this, that it is Edgar Allan Poe himself? Is that in any of the readings that you did? Is, do anybody believe that? Uh, no, I, I think it's it's sort of a, in the back of people's minds a romantic you know idea, but it's you know if it's something witnessed by ghost stories as we know them are usually like they're. The thing about ghost stories is there's usually not a lot of witnesses. Yes. And this is one where like uh, 
maybe like 150 people might have showed up every year to to look at this so yeah um it's it's only uh in fun that it would be treated like like that i know you said cognac too but like my brain went to only seeing the shadow of like tim meadows drinking cavassier at this tombstone site <laughs> right away. that's where my brain went and i was like this is a totally different type of tradition <laughs> it, that was that was one thing i found weird when i was initially researching this was uh cognac is not mentioned in any post stories like you you think like amontillado the most famous drink he, he mentions mm. but uh so i i did dig a little deeper than that. It, it appears that the 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 toaster himself left a note at one point that indicated that was actually sentimental to his own family and didn't have anything to, to do with Poe. So it was him adding to the tradition. Right. Hmm. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. That's another one I did not know about. So, uh, all of our Baltimore fan, thank you for <laughs> sticking around to hear that. One. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We are uh, huge in Baltimore. We're huge. We're enormous. Enormous. En- <laughs> enormous in Baltimore. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say. Is that we, what people the, from Baltimore sound like? <laughs> yes, it is. They, they sound, they, they sound uh, vaguely uh, Bostonian. That's absolutely what they sound like. um, I don't know. I watched, I watched all five seasons of The Wire. I don't remember that. <laughs> so, so did I. Absolutely. Uh, do you not remember, uh, what, what was his name? What was uh, I- I- Idris Elba's character? Um, uh, Stringer, Stringer Bell. Bell. Yeah, remember when he when he'd be like, uh, "Yeah, this is know, Stringer. I'm Idris Elba. I'm Stringer Bell." <laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> it's like, that's how you stack that paper. I, that, I think that's how he said it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. but, um, the Baltimore Stringer Bell witch. That's what will be coming next week. <laughs> exactly, uh, Mitch. Your number three, if you so do please. Number three. Oh yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we're doing. Uh, yeah, we're doing the episode. Okay, we're in a goddamn um, okay, so- show, bro. <laughs> So my this is another one. This is another. I think this is a perfect start to a horror film. Um, it has all the ingredients of it, and this uh, I've experienced. This is another character I've experienced uh, in my life. This is someone. Um, his name. This is a real a real guy. He is now deceased. Uh, so I, I I can I can speak ill of him as I will now, but. Um, uh, it was an old gentleman. Uh, his name was Harlan. He lived at the end of a lonely cabin road near my grandparents' farm. And I have memories of him as a child, him walking, ambling about. Uh, you'd see him walk by during holidays when I would be visiting my family. Uh, but the, the origin of this horror story for me, though, is one night we're leaving – because my grandparents only lived about two hours away from uh, our, our our home, we would we would drive home at, at the end of uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas. We would rarely stay overnight. So it's late uh, Thanksgiving, perhaps a bit of driving snow, a couple inches of snow, um, which would happen a lot in Minnesota. And we're we're pulling out, and this figure gets in front of our car, and like, you know. Hey, whoa, 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 gives us the, gives us the two waving hands, like caution, hold on here. And it's Harlan and he comes, and he comes walking next to the car. He, he doesn't have a coat on. He's just like in maybe a shirt jack or something. And it's, it's cold out. Um, and it's Minnesota. So everything's like another, like just subtract 15 degrees. And that's Minnesota at all times pretty much. <laughs> and, and he insists that my dad like roll down the windows, like roll down the window. And, uh, of course this is just with a hand motion. And then, so my dad puts it on the window and he's like, Hey, Harlan. And now my dad grew up on this farm where, you know, we're, we're at this holiday. So my dad has known or has known of Harlan since he was like a teenager when Harlan moved in. Harlan's never been married. Harlan has always lived alone in a house. Harlan has not improved his house or done anything to advance his life really since, you know, the, the, the I, I have to right? I have to interject here, and I am yeah. aware in my life of three people named Harlan, mm-hmm. and you have described exactly every one of them to a T. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then this is this then this is a television series. This is not a one off film. Then this is multiple episodes, multiple people. Four uh, Harlans Tuesdays on CBS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of them know how to cook for themselves. Uh, okay, uh, but, Chuck uh, Laurie brings you. 
Go ahead. Yeah. And so, so Harlan's like rolled down the window and he's like, Hey, how's like, hi, how's it going? <laughs> and my dad's like, good. Harlan. Hi. How are you? Like, what the fuck? It's nine 30 Thanksgiving night. What the fuck do you want? Yeah. And he's like, and then he's like, well, I just, uh, I just, I found these just up the road. I thought, I thought, uh, your boy in the back there might want them. Like, <laughs> what? motioning to my older brother, Andy, as he holds up a pair of boxer shorts. What? A loose <laughs> pair of boxer shorts. Are you kidding me? Swear to God. And what oh, did my dad, dad say? My dad was. This is see. This is why Minnesota also sucks because my dad wasn't like, "What the fuck? Get away from us! Yeah. Back up!" Or just slammed on the gas and left. My dad was so polite. He's like, "I the, thank, thank you, you, Harlan," and he took the <laughs> pair of boxer shorts. <laughs> no, please yes. don't tell me this. He took the pair of boxer shorts. He took the pair of boxer shorts. He oh, took the a pair. pair of boxer shorts. <laughs> he took the pair of boxer shorts. From a man named never... Harlan. Oh, I 15th. feel like this would have been somehow been less insidious if it was like August 7th. Like being Thanksgiving night just adds this extra sinister sinister twist to it. Right. The time, like, the snow, everything makes it so much weirder. <laughs> and, you know, again, it, it, it's the perfect start of a horror movie because, again, Harlan, he's never... Never had a partner, never had kids, just as always lived by himself out in this little house. Like all the other houses around are like they've added on to them. They've updated them. And Harlan sits there in that shack, frozen in time, walking that little lonely road. He's a Uh, purist. He is offended by the modern invention of boxer briefs. Presenting loose pairs of boxer shorts he supposedly there's a, there's a found whole, on the road. That's just it. There's a whole other part of this. The presenting to you and your father and your brother is already weird enough. Mm-hmm. He came upon said boxers mm-hmm. in a snowstorm. Where did they come from? Somewhere. I do mm-hmm. remember. I, I have a picture of this. I was at the uh, Irving Park Blue Line. L station here in Chicago and on the far side of the tracks, this is uh, the Irving Park Blue Line station on either side. It's at highway level on an overpass and on either side, there is the highway. So you don't access this from the far side, but on the far side of the tracks from the platform where I was standing was a pair of blue jeans. Mm Mm-hmm. And I do not know that story, but I have it has haunted me ever since. What happened to where did the blue jeans come from? Who took them off? How did they get to that geographic point? Yeah. That will bother me for the rest of my days. Yeah. Yeah. And this Did you ever think this, about grabbing them, picking them up, and offering them to Mitch or I? No. <laughs> I was I wanted nothing to do with these blue jeans. Yeah. Well, that's, that's your problem, all right? <laughs> well, okay, you, you know what's also creepy about this is that I have a very big family, so we were not the only car leaving from the house that night. And also the fact that he looked at – who knows if he if he just sussed it upon getting next to the car or if he – I mean he knew my dad for many decades. He knew mm-hmm. my dad was. Maybe he had been watching my brother and like saw like, ooh, this, this husky boy needs a pair of boxer shorts. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, his but, his current his current under bridges aren't sitting right. So <laughs> right, yeah, and uh, and and then also th- as as an aside, the way the Harlan story ends, the last the last thing of note I heard about Harlan was that he was forcibly removed and then arrested, detained because he would not leave an RV World um, uh, showroom floor, a place where you buy <laughs> RVs. He made a scene and wouldn't leave and had to call the cops in central Minnesota. I don't know what he did, but he would have had to do a lot to get the cops called on him. So look at this aisle of of recreational boxers. How many people have gone missing to leave these here? 
Right? It comes from, like what kind of scene could you pop? Is he going to purchase an RV? Is, is, is how, many, how many how many uh, yeah boxers is he gonna pick up in an RV when he like you know gets young men into the RV? I don't know. I don't know. There's so don't much know. storage. So much storage is, for boxers. Is Harlan still alive? Do we know? No, Harlan died. Uh, it's it's probably been close to a decade now that he's been dead. But yeah, Harlan's yeah. are Harlan's are gonna go extinct if they aren't already because nobody's naming their baby Harlan. It's no. like like oh well, what what are you gonna have if it's a if, like what are you gonna name it if it's a girl? Oh, uh, Jessica. And if it's a boy, oh, uh, Salvador. And what if what if you're gonna have a seventy eight year old man, Harlan? Yep. <laughs> There's no ba- can you imagine a baby Harlan? I'm what the just fuck is baby Harlan? I'm just I picturing can- like a white rural family picking <laughs> El Salvador over Harlan in their baby book. Where is her life? This seems more logical in rural Minnesota There's- for our family line than Harlan. In 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 Helsinki, they're naming people Salvador more often than they are Harlan. Oh, it's- good lord. Also, see every Harlan have- I've ever known, and I the three that I've known, I think I never saw any of them not in uh, bib overalls. Oh. <laughs> oh, classic outfit! Absolutely, yeah. That's so Harlan. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much trash on the bib overalls, only because my grandfather wore them without shirts, uh, so we can get those sweet bib overall tan lines uh, late. Uh, when, until the year he died. Oh, but yeah. Overalls are coming back. I'm just saying Harlan's... Yeah. The, uh, overalls should be a part of a balanced wardrobe. But the, <laughs> the Harlan's of the world, it's a strict, just all overalls all the time. <laughs> in my experience. Yep. We're yep. going to say overalls, good on the farm. Maybe don't wear them to the showroom floor yeah. of your nearest RV world. Uh, mm-hmm. Nathan, uh, for... what? What was your number three? <laughs> what was this one again? The, it was the 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 ever so memorable Poe toaster, okay. of course. Oh, we were still on Poe. I couldn't remember if we had another one before that. Poe, I have down here three points for it because I love the mysteriousness of this one. And Mitch, I was going to give you three points as well, but you used the Minnesota phrase shirt jack, and we don't <laughs> use that down here. So you're going to get two points. Uh, <laughs> that's not a thing. My Back dad to- is going to send you an, an, an angry email. Uh, I mean, Angry in quotations, but yeah. Um. It, it pains me to have to write this, but I'm so sorry that shirt jack is <laughs> never. No. Uh, My dad loves a shirt jack. He loves a shirt jack. So he's got four of them. Shirt jack. Four shirt jack, Daryl. All right. <laughs> Nathan, you're number two, please. I don't even know what a shirt jack is. Uh, okay, number two. Um, uh, number two is. The ghost <laughs> of none other than Abraham Lincoln. Ooh. Oh, what a, this is too sexy. This is too sexy of a pick. <laughs> well, too it's, sexy it's, of a pick. Oddly enough, it's going to get sexier. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I am the son of an Illinois lawyer. I have uh, my, my senior prom and my junior prom. Uh, I went to school with about seven people, so it was... <laughs> Slim pickings. It, it was a whole village prom, but it, it was actually at the site of a Lincoln Douglas debate. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, there, there's a, a, a statue, or not a statue, uh, not even a bust, just like a gigantic copper Lincoln face. <laughs> and it was a there. This is several places in in Illinois. There's there's sta- maybe when I say several, I might mean two. But, um, <laughs> like there's 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 one definitely at Lincoln's tomb. It's like yeah, you rub you rub the nose, and so he's got like a real shiny nose. Yeah, uh, sure. This is a, this is a thing. Anyways, Lincoln didn't show up at my prom. Um, that was and <laughs> yeah, and boy, it would have spiced things up because my prom was not exciting. <laughs> uh, we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> um, so, Wait, was it was it not that spicy because the music wasn't that good, or was it was was the well, pre dance dinner? Did that leave something to um, to desire? The, the dinner did suck. I can confirm that. But also, I I graduated high school with twenty two people in my class, about a hundred students in the high school altogether. Mm-hmm. Prom was 
like maybe there were like a few other people from outside schools who had been invited and then like a good 14 to 16 teacher chaperones <laughs> there and so it was it was it was everybody I had seen every single day of my life for the last 18 years, which was the totality of my existence. We had sure. all been around each other forever. It was just like, it's like, yeah, this wonderful. is, this is basically study hall in tuxedos. It was <laughs> so boring. Um, and, uh, and, and let me guess, Nathan, you were always looking for a way to cut study hall. You were never there to study. I, yeah, I remember we went mushroom hunting a lot in your study hall. <laughs> um, we we used to play a game called Stick Wars where we'd throw sticks at each other. <laughs> um, Whoa! Yeah, there was there were some trees in the back, so it worked uh, out. Yes. Anyways, Perfect what was I talking wars. about? Abraham Lincoln. Oh, yeah. that's right, that's right, yeah. So, Abraham Lincoln, little known fact, he was assassinated, mm-hmm. so that's fun. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, wrongful death tied into ghost sightings and what have you. Correct. Uh, and I love Abraham Lincoln. I, I really do. This is legitimate. I absolutely love him. I think he was the most fascinating American who ever lived. And I would love to be haunted by him so I could talk to him. And all the hauntings I've heard tell sort of the same spirit of Lincoln, of the the wise old sage, but with a sense of humor. Uh, brevity is the soul of wit and Lincoln... Uh, you know, in a few in a in a short seven word sentence, he could say everything. Uh, one of my most prized possessions is a book my grandpa gave me, and it was printed in the 1800s called "The Wit and Wisdom of Abraham Lincoln," and it's all his letters, and it is absolutely fascinating. He's just such an intellect. Even in a, in a seven second haunting or vision, I feel I like my life could change. He could turn things around. But then I'm going to give you a, a couple of uh, White House hauntings that have stuck with me that uh, I think are have stood the test of time because they're somewhat plausible. So the first was Winston Churchill was staying in the Lincoln bedroom and he, mm-hmm. Winston Churchill liked to end his evenings by taking a long hot bath, drinking brandy and uh, smoking a cigar. Yep. No surprise there. Yep. Mm. So old Winston takes his bath, drinks his brandy, smokes his cigar in the Lincoln, gets up, doesn't put on a robe or anything. He saunters back into the Lincoln bedroom, and there is the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. (gasps) And he turns around, and uh, (laughs) Winston Churchill says his words were, Mr. President, you have caught me at a disadvantage. And Lincoln just looked down and smirked, and then uh, disappeared into the ether. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then the the other that i like is uh lyndon johnson when he was president was uh you know the, the vietnam war was raging and and johnson had been thrust into the presidency after kennedy's assassination and he finds himself at a time of crisis and overwhelmed and it's three in the morning and he's strolling the halls and he doesn't know what to do and he wanders into the lincoln bedroom and the ghost of lincoln appears and he says oh mr lincoln Please tell me, how do you handle an unpopular war? And Lincoln apparently says, don't go to the theater. <laughs> because you'll be killed. Ah, yes. One, Great. two, is this thing on? <laughs> it's good advice. It's good advice. I th- you know, from what I know about LBJ is he did most of his best thinking while on the toilet. So uh, I think maybe that story could be in the shitter too perhaps uh, ah, you know mm. i don't know i'm just i'm just i'm just putting it out there but um L- lbj, LBJ he, he had the other like, i've heard a lot of lbj stories it doesn't sound like a very pleasant man to be around but apparently oh, he would god no he was awful he, he would he would shake he's a big man six four 250 probably he would shake yeah. your hand and just lean into you and not let go and just talk really loud into your ear and just like that's how he would introduce himself just assert his dominance yeah i i don't think i would enjoy meeting old lbj but i i i, I feel like if, if lbj was a meal it'd be like a 32 ounce porterhouse cooked <laughs> to burnt and you're like god i gotta eat this <laughs> <laughs> Like, Son might as well bitch. just just chew all the way through a saddle. 
yeah just like and your jaws yeah it's just it's over by the end you're like mitch once again you're ruining next week's episode of top five burnt presidential steaks (laughs) (laughs) steaks based on presidential personalities there's so many ways we could take this there there is there's so many um I feel bad yeah. for Churchill. Like he, he he meets a president that's so good with words, and he only gets a smirk. Is that just, it's either because Churchill is bad at writing a retort, or maybe Lincoln is the first and best stand up comedian of all time? He would have been good. He would have been very good. Good with the one liners. One my favorite. Is this thing on? I, I got I, I my favorite Lincoln line ever is it was about. Uh, about Ulysses S. Grant uh, and so Civil War was going like shit and then Ulysses S. Grant was pretty good long story short and <laughs> and then a lot of Grant was unpopular with a lot of people because Grant was just drunk all the time yes. loved his whiskey and so there, there's some telegrams in this this book see Lincoln would have been great on Twitter and this is a great example of how great he would have been on Twitter is uh, somebody had said and was like he's you know, Grant is uh, just drunk all the time. He's just always drinking whiskey, whatever. And and Lincoln responded, well, what kind of whiskey is he drinking so I can send a crate of it to the rest of my generals? Aha! That's very true. That's good. That's good. I, th- I mean, in, in, in those days, too, it was like I think everyone ran on booze. So, like, whoever ran on the best booze was probably going to win, most likely, right? Yeah, and I, I I can only imagine the the best whiskey in 1864 <laughs> must have must have just tasted like paint remover. Oh, <laughs> Whatever God. one was drinkable, that's the best one. Yeah. All right, oh I'm a little God. jealous of this. I wish I could uh, to uh, have the chance to meet uh, Mr. Lincoln as well. Uh, Mitchell, your number two, please. Yeah. So my number two would be to um, I've actually been to this place uh in real life and but it was during the day so i couldn't experience its true haunt its true horror um it's real spirits but i would love to be there to experience the bone rattling the soul crushing horrifying nature of the eastern state penitentiary in philadelphia during its during the height of its of its terror um this was uh, again ahead of its time. Uh, it was um, built to look like a terrifying castle to to defer or to defer deter criminals. Excuse me. Um, and what was inter- interesting about this place is that they call it a penitentiary because it was the very first uh, prison of its kind to be built to try and create penitence or p- penitence. I can't say that word now. All of a sudden. In, in its in its uh, in the criminals, so basically, they were not allowed to speak to each other, to the guards. They couldn't sing. It was trying to be complete silence. Um, they ate alone. They exercised alone. They read alone. They could only read the Bible. Uh, when they were taken out of their cells for perhaps medical care or to be moved, uh, a hood would would be put on them. All the guards wore felt like slippies to make it as quiet as possible. And in the design of this prison, they thought that this peaceful nature, this Zen, if you will, would create uh, remorsefulness in the criminals. And it turns out when you leave someone by themselves and turn all the noise off and take away human interaction, everyone goes fucking nuts. And that's exactly what happened. And, I've been to this prison and it was left in, in pretty much decay from, I'd say like 1940s on or whatever. Uh, but you stand in the middle of the rotunda and you can spin and see straight down the hallways of all the seven original cell blocks. And it's super, super creepy because each of them have a, uh, like a rounded ceiling to it and the light comes in from skylights. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's just at once, um, confining, uh, you know, uh, 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 obviously like prison structure, but it feels like touched by God at the same time. There's light coming in. That's in fact, like each cell, this also seemed very forward thinking at the time too. And they built it. Each cell had its own toilet. Each cell had its own skylight. 
um, which would, you know, not be thought of in prisons at that time. Uh, and so it's like, there's this light, so there's, it feels natural at some point, but it's just now it's like, everything just feels like it's rotting Ugh. and like, like it's like the whole building is sort of like dying on top of you kind of thing. Um, and there are, you know, multiple, multiple stories to tell of, you know, uh, people going crazy in there being sent to the, uh, doctor and them just, you know, not knowing what the hell to do with them, like just, you know, bloodletting or strapping them down and, you know, injecting them with chemicals to soothe them, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, a truly horrifying place. Um, the most famous inmate ever there was Al Capone. Uh, but in his cell, it was right near the rotunda. He had his own rugs. He had oil paintings. He had his own wine. Essentially, it was a little apartment for him, which many people think that he... Uh, set all this up to get caught and put into prison for like two or three years. I think he was there at the height of re retaliation from his enemies to like remain safe from violence. Um, Makes sense. Which is kind of interesting. But um, this, this prison first came to my attention though, many years back because a classic MTV show called fear. I don't know if either of you ever saw this, but it was a show reality show. They had contestants and they brought people to the most haunted places on earth or in America, and they had to do challenges. So at, at, they went to Eastern State Penitentiary for one of the episodes. People had to go inside the cells and sleep for a night. They had to stay for seven hours. No, thank you. And Right? And so, uh, of course, there's going to be, I mean, spirits coursing through that place, uh, torturing uh, souls. Yeah, uh, production assistants <laughs> banging vents. Yeah. No, 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 no. These were spirits and they were ghosts and they were spookies and, 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 and thrills in the night. Absolutely. No. Um, but uh, it, I, I went there, I toured it uh, a couple of Christmases ago and it is a, it is a, a truly chilling thing. And I stood in cells by myself like I like you could open the door and you could close it behind yourself. I closed the, the door and just like stood in a cell and literally uh, I did it like in maybe like six or seven, just trying to, I don't know, soak up some kind of energy. And like the fifth time I did it, I literally, it was like one of those classic cold air sweeps through you and just engages your entire spine. That's what I felt. It was truly, truly creepy. Um, and no, I, I will close with a quote from Charles Dickens himself, the legend. He visited the prison in 1842, and he said, The system here is rigid, strict, and hopeless solitary confinement. I believe it, in its, eff in, in its effects, to be cruel and wrong. I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. Um, Ooh. He visited in 1842? When was it built? 1829. Holy moly. Yeah. Yeah. This it, it, early it, in the country's infancy, we came this, up with this. Yeah. When this, when this prison was built, it was the largest building in the country too, at the time at its, at its construction. So 1829, wow. we came up yeah. with this. Yeah. Ugh. That's, uh, ugh, I don't need to know. We're, we're moving on. I need to score this. so I don't have to hear any more about this damn no, prison. You, you just, just Google it. The, those of you listening at home, Google it and get some photos up. Photos alone will, will creep the hell out of you. It is, it is truly, truly spooky stuff. So. Oh, I can't um, do this. Oh, I am thoroughly creeped out, sir. So you're immediately getting three points for this round. Yes. Uh, Nathan, uh, I'm going to give you two points for this round as well. And to try and keep us on time here we're going to move on to our number one so nathan mm -hmm. your number one for me please Am I, so i'm taking the uh title title of the episode is uh ha well, hauntings you you wish you were haunted by something yeah, along something you were lines. a party to said haunt so I you wish had a party with a haunt, but you were party to a haunt <laughs> I, I i wish that i had been party to a haunt on this yep. occasion I sure. wish so badly that I had been party to a haunt on this. and But this is a true story. Every word I'm going to say to you is true. But I wish I had been a party to a haunt. All right. Here All we right. go. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So Give this is the, the Ghost in the Window. This took <gasps> place in Lincoln Park in 2007. Whoa. So it was uh, May of 2007. It was May 30th of 2007. I remember this 
very vividly. And uh, I ended the school year and I was uh, venturing off to my uh, then girlfriend's house. She lived at the back of a brownstone, very near the campus of DePaul. First floor, but like, you know, raised first floor of a brownstone. And uh, there was uh, the brown line train. The brown and red line trains ran through like, you know, the alley, like just behind the house. Mm -hmm. And it was a very balmy May day. So no air conditioning in this particular apartment. So the window was cracked open and uh, it was a a small little bedroom, you know, student housing or or not student housing, but student affordable housing. Mm, Yes. And so, so so, so a crappy apartment is what you're saying. (laughs) It was, it was about as nice as, or uh, slightly nicer than the one I live in now. And (laughs) it was charming. It was charming. Charming. Yes. Rustic. (laughs) Vintage. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> shitty and <laughs> and so we we were uh it was it was late at night so the bed was positioned like right by the window that we had cracked open so like your oh, yeah. feet were about my feet were maybe 12 to 18 inches away from where this window was that was cracked oh. open and the apartment was like a raised ground floor so maybe like yep. 10 feet off the ground is where the the window is and uh we we had just enjoyed some quality time together, some special moments. Oh my gosh! And then slow down, uh, slow down. hold on. <laughs> uh, what did that? So, so so what kind of pie did you guys share in bed? Is that, is that, is that what you mean you guys had some pie or something? Yeah, it it was a creme brulee actually, Ooh. but less mess. Nice. So, so the creme brulee had uh, been fully consumed, mm-hmm. and. Uh, <laughs> I, eyes were closing, uh, drifting off into dreamland. And so the thing about this apartment with the train was that the 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 lights at the the headlights of the train would pass by, and it would it would be quite you know jarring mm-hmm. while while you were asleep because it was you know so close. And so the lights came by and they hit me in the face, and I was like, oh geez, that's brighter than normal. And then I thought, I don't hear a train. I'm only getting light. There is no sound of train. So I roll over and I look to the window and I see about 18 inches away from my feet the outline of a man's head and a flashlight being held up pointing straight at me. And so I, and I'm proud of the way I reacted, I jump up and I scream, what the fuck? And I I. <laughs> My my girlfriend, who had already fallen asleep, I pick her up and I hoist her out of the room. Just like, like violently, like just get her out of the room. So gentlemanly. Great. And wow. then I, I slam the door and I turn around, turn on the light. And then there's nobody there. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, what did what did I just see something? Did I just dream something? Was I dreaming? I was fully asleep. Was that? I, I don't know what the hell just happened. And so... Uh, did, the, my, did, 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 did the guy in the window look anything like the painting behind me right now? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, so, so like, uh, I, 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 the, I, the flashlight was in my eyes, so all I saw oh. was like a silhouette. I couldn't see it, a thing. That's the scariest. And, dude, flashlights in your eyes are the scariest thing ever. It's terrifying. Absolutely and terrifying. So then, so then I... Uh, my, my girlfriend, who had been asleep through this, was really confused at what the hell was going on. For sure. And so she opened the door and was like, what is going on? And I was like trying to explain this. And I was very frantic. And uh, she didn't really know what to make of it. But she, So she had a roommate. So we immediately checked on the roommate. The roommate's fine. But I at this point, I, like, I started to question myself. I'm like, did I just... Was this just like a bad dream, you know? And yeah. And so I uh, we called nine one one, and the police came, and they were like, "Well, what happened?" And they, they asked me my story, and they're like, well, "Well, come outside and and show me like like which window is it?" And so we walked around and through the 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 very thin alleys between the the brownstones, you know, 
mm-hmm. like the little the little walkways to the side doors, and we walked into the back. And so there's the window, cracked open about ten to twelve feet up, and underneath the window, a lawn chair had been dragged over, and then a bucket placed on top. So somebody had definitely climbed up. Holy and I did not imagine it. It really happened. And it that was the scariest moment of my entire life to date. Oh, I shit myself. Not really, but uh, I was absolutely fucking mortified because until like until I saw the chair and the bucket, uh-huh. I had been hoping I had oh, just dreamed this. Yeah, for sure. it had been it had been yeah. an apparition, whatever. But yeah. no, it wasn't. That had actually happened. So, anyways, uh, my girlfriend and I we we didn't stay the night there. We after the police report was filed and everything, we went to my dorm and I I laid in my uh, top bunk bed, staring at the ceiling. Did not sleep a wink. How Called my you? sister yeah. the next day, crying and was like i want to leave this school i don't want to live in this city anymore i'm just, I'm just i was just absolutely petrified too embarrassed to tell my parents um i was super young this is my first like serious girlfriend where yeah. staying the night was a thing that happened pretty regularly and and so i just didn't even tell them until like a few years later when I was with them and another friend and I was like, oh yeah, this story. And my parents were like, what? <laughs> and yeah. I forgot I hadn't told them. And um, wow. luckily, the the reason I remember the exact date, May 30th, is because uh, my girlfriend was a senior. She was graduating. May 31st was the end of release. So luckily, literally the next day, her parents were showing up with a truck with like a pod thing on the back and moving them out. So none of us ever stayed another night in that apartment. What? But, uh, what? Yeah. That's that incredible. Is terrifying. It was uh, awful. And so the reason I say that's my number one is I wish I had been haunted. I wish that hadn't happened. I wish I hadn't seen the chair and the bucket. I wish because oh, it God. just chilled me to the absolute bone. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of what ifs that, and I'll, I'll leave those to the imagination of anybody listening but wow. I've played them out in my head a thousand times. And uh, yeah, scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Wow. <laughs> well, oh my gosh. top that, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, thanks for leaving like a lot of openings for jokes or that. Appreciate that. Wow. Cool guy. Um, <laughs> God. Uh, wow, that is absolutely uh, terrifying. Yeah. I, I, th- what, what, what that makes me think of is I've read the book and saw some of the HBO documentary about the Golden State Killer. And, uh, you know, that happened in California in the 70s or whatever. And then going back and looking at um, – because he targeted homes that were designed a certain way where they had – like basically the, the back of the home was all glass. Um, and so – when you are, of course, when you have the lights on inside your home at night and it's all glass, you look out, you can't see the yard at all. Yeah. So that creep could just stand in the backyard and just like watch and study, basically. Yeah. And study. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I asked a lot of questions about how long had they been there? How, like, had they staked the place out? Did they just, were they just an opportunist who saw an open window and thought they'd look in? I don't know. I don't know the answer to any of those. I've gone down all those rabbit holes. None of them are pleasant. It was, yeah, it was, it was, uh, pretty bad. I am so glad you told me this story after I have lived in a first floor apartment. Cause if I would have known this two years ago, I would have not been a happy camper. (laughs) This is absolutely terrifying. Ah, get it, get an air conditioner. That is the moral of the story. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Um, Mitch, you're number well, one. Yeah, this one, this one, um, I thankfully don't have as vivid memories of because I was a young child when it happened. But uh, this is also uh, ripped straight from the headlines of my own life. Um, and this is, again, another perfect germination point for a great horror film. And uh, that is when I was a very young boy. Uh, my parents, they lived in a, an apartment complex in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, uh, on the weekends, 
my my mom, she's a microbiologist. She would work at the hospital, so she was working the weekends. So it was my my brother uh, Andy. So I was probably uh, I don't know maybe one one and a half or something maybe two. My brother would have been four or five, um, and uh, my dad would be. I'm, I'm assuming working like he, he had a, a studio down in the basement of the apartment building, and my parents got a break on rent and they like took care of the building for that at the same time. So my dad had had a, a desk set up and he'd be working. So we kind of just kind of run around and, you know, my dad would work and kind of watch us. And um, uh, that happened a number of times. Over weekends, we, you know, we were safe, whatever. My mom would come home. Things seemed normal. And then she noticed uh, in the hallways, someone had taken photos of my brother and I. And some were of us looking at the camera, some were not. And they were put up in the in the hallway with uh, scripture quotes and like what? some embellished, like flower embellishment or whatever. And uh, turns out the there was a woman that rented uh, a closet in the basement, like a large closet was her f- full abode that she rented. And this woman would entice or lure my brother and I away uh, sorry, dad, to call you out here for not watching us cl- closely enough, but she would lure us away and take photos of us and I guess spend time with us and thought that our beautiful little child innocence need to be shared with the, with the building. And there was, I don't know how many, I think, I think it was like a 20 unit building, maybe more. I don't know. So there's enough people in the building that didn't need to have our photos up in the hallways with, with scripture. No. Um, and my mom had to had to talk to the woman multiple times to get her to stop doing this or attempting to do it as well. Uh, and again, my mind only goes to why did she only rent a large closet that didn't have running water or a kitchen? Why was that enough to live in at this point? Like, but then she had a camera to take photos of kids and to post them, and like, and then I'm thinking. This is a great start for a movie where like this woman rents many closets and buildings all over the city and is like recruiting children for a cult or something. I don't know, but it just it 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 creeps oh. me out to no end. And of course, you know, creepy photos of children who are unknowing and, and you know, unwilling as well. And then scripture with it, like go Ugh, go so jump off creepier. a cliff. Yeah. So you you're too young to remember. Does your brother remember this? My brother, his, his only memories is that this woman would talk to us and okay. didn't seem dangerous, but didn't seem I mean, cool. It's kindergarten. Either. Like, what are you going to remember? Like, yeah, it's. Yeah. yeah. That's that just so, so unsettling. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, you know, also like the, the basement of the building, it's not some beautiful finished basement. Like this is a fucking basement. Who's you know? also the landlord that says, yeah, you can rent that space. That's not yeah. weird at all. Yeah. Who's complicit in 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 that? That's just so creepy. There was uh, a number of of offsetting individuals that lived in the building. Um and also actually my parents they lived in a elevated first floor apartment too. And uh one day when when everyone was out to work and daycare and whatnot, uh their I guess our whole place got robbed completely. So Oh jeez. Um, yeah. Well, good news is that's that wasn't the family home forever. That's Yes. Horrifying. Yes. Thank God. Uh, but I mean, can you imagine though? Like I, I, I'm only thinking of the cops show up and the woman is like, Oh yes. Uh, what? Yes. I'm, I'm Mary Ellen. Uh, what, what happens to be the problem? You know? And they're like, step aside, you know, like we're going to go inside your closet and then it's just photos, papered, fucking, but fucking floor to ceiling papered with photos of like young children throughout the the neighborhood, or whatever. It creeps me out to this to the end of the day. Uh, it oh, it just it sends chills up my spine. Um, it Nathan, your oh. story sent chills up my spine. This is a chilling episode, you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm chilled. I'm so uncomfortable. I am I am very upset. We should not one have done this so late at night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah well, it's, it's my clock on the wall says two fourteen a.m. Due to due to yeah. some. Extenuating circumstances and technical difficulties. We're recording at two fourteen a.m. for the Halloween episode. Yeah, we are Dumbest leaning into it. Ever. We're leaning into it yeah. too much. I think. <laughs> so, 
I'm uh, giving you guys both three points for this round because this is the first one. You guys really kept all the stops hidden for number one here. Uh, these are the only two that actually gave me goosebumps, and I still have them right now. They're fucking terrifying. What's even more upsetting is you guys were tied. 13 points each before this. <gasps> oh, 13. And as you know, my bonus point was going to go to the person who gave me the chills the most. You both did it. So at a 14 points, we have a tie today because. Oh, my God. At least it gets us off of 13 because that. Yeah, is that's true. Horrifying. <laughs> what is wrong with us? Oh, my God. <laughs> what is wrong with oh. us? Oh. oh, my God. I guess now I got to do a fast five. It's. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, folks, but let's hopefully we can turn this around before we leave. Uh, here we go with my fast five top five scarring Halloween costumes to see on your loved ones. Number five, seeing your dad in a male plug costume when your mom dresses as an outlet. Like, come on, we don't need the reminders. As far as I'm concerned, my sister and I believe you two have only had sex twice and we want to keep it that way. Ugh. Number four, seeing Uncle Greg's bulge in his two sizes, two small Spider-Man costume. First off, Greg, the mask doesn't cover your double chin. Uh, the top shirt is boycotting the pants with a beer belly barrier. And I didn't think Spider-Man wore capris. All right. Seeing super bad years later would finally provide the analogy of a division sign that you were looking for to describe this bulge monstrosity, you know, ball, dick, ball. And poor Uncle Greg, all potatoes, no meat. Sorry, Aunt Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, that time your sister wore a convincing clown getup. Now, you know it's your sister, but there is just something about the emotionless expression on her face after she consumed too much sugar. The makeup was just runny enough to etch the face of this terrifying despair in your memory, and this is the face that you'll see in the shadows, under your bed, and behind doors well into your adulthood. Oh, fuck, that year did a number on me. All right, <laughs> number two. <laughs> Your friend's mom in a detailed yet non-sexual getup. There's nothing scary about this, but this is the moment you realize you won't ever care about anything as much as she cared about making that costume. You're only seven, and you know it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, your hot cousin in a cleavage-heavy little red riding hood costume. I'm sorry, did, did, I, oh, sorry, did I say hot? <laughs> I meant I meant seeing her in a nurse in, in nursing rhyme type thing. Sorry, not nursing, nursery rhyme. It's not like you, you you know she's your cousin, but you're just worried that like she wouldn't, you know, like she'd be flaunting it out there and you're like, you know, you know how guys are. And it's just like you're the good guy here. You're just trying to look out. And I'm just I'm so confused. Is this is what therapy's for? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe this is normal. This is normal. I, oh God, what if I'm not normal? Is this the sort of something serious, long-term shit? First, is this then? Uh, wait, is this when candy loses its taste? Wait, I still like candy. Twix is my favorite. I got a lot of Twix. Yeah, I'm going to eat this whole bag of Twix. Twix makes everything okay. <laughs> and that is the Fast Five <laughs> costumes that scarred your childhood. Uh, that's this week's edition of Uber Senko from the hellish haunts of Old Irving Park has been... Nathan George Henenfent. And from atop Sopico's magnificent manor has been... Mitchell Anthony Brinkman. And I have been Brian Erst. And as Bizbear always says, uh, hey, that's not my thigh. Auf Wiedersehen and adios. <laughs>You've just listened to Uber Cinco, a production of UBK Studios. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your fine podcasts from. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, please visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash UBK Studios. Every little bit helps us keep the lights on and the bill collectors at bay. Keep tabs on us on all the social media at UBK Studios, and most importantly, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see that we really are just a bunch of good Midwestern boys. Yeah.